Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Veterans Live Show, live from LZ Bunker. I'm Ronnie Embers, your host. I serve with the 101st v uh, Airborne Division, B Company, 1st of the 502nd Infantry in Vietnam from Dece December 1967 to December 1968. Tonight, we have a very special guest, some kind of person I've never met before. First time for me, and hope maybe for you. He's a CB. His name is John Backman from Cutstown, PA, Petty Officer Second Class, Construction Mechanic with the Seabees, and also served as a Staff Sergeant in the Army, total of 22 years. So we're going to bring John into the bunker now. How you doing, John? Hello, Ron. It's an honor being with you on your show. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, John, tell us a little bit about your, your early service time well, there. I enlisted in the United States Navy uh, 21 April 1966. Uh, went to boot camp uh, 1 June 66 to August the 12th, 66. Then I got orders for uh, Cecil Field Naval Air Station Weapons Department, which was a nuclear weapons storage facility. And I was there for a year and... Um, uh, we ran uh, uh, convoys to Mayport, Florida. No, just go on to your next uh, to next duty station. How you got the? Okay, after uh, Florida, we went. I, I went to Vietnam, and then after Vietnam, I went to Naples, Italy. All righty. Now, yeah, tell us about those. Uh, how many MOSs were in the CBs? Well. The, I, I sort of misled you on that. The Navy doesn't use MOS, but it uses NEC, Naval Enlisted. Uh, it's the it's same thing with the, like the, with the Army uh, military, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, yeah, military occupational specialty. Specialty, right. There you go. Thank you. Okay. And, and what, uh, what are the seven? Do you know? I mean, uh, you might, you shouldn't. What are the seven uh, specialties? Seven, seven rates in the CBs are equipment operators, construction mechanics, construction electricians, builders, electric uh, engineering aides. I'm sorry, <laughs> and uh, steel workers and utility men, which you be your plumbers and so forth. Okay, and how about those convoys you ran in Florida? We ran the nuclear bombs on flatbed trucks to Midport, Florida for the aircraft carriers. Really? Nuclear yeah. nuclear bombs on a, on a truck? What? What, what, you know, can you remember some of the aircraft carriers? Uh, Shangri-La and the Roosevelt. There you go. That was heavy duty at Roosevelt for sure. And uh, maybe, tell us about your, your the duty station with the barracks set up there. Uh, half of it was Marine Corps. They were our security for the compound that stored the uh, nuclear weapons in, and uh, the other half was uh, Navy personnel, the, the guys that worked on the nuclear weapons and a few Seabees. There weren't too many Seabees there. I got you. All right, now we're going to do a video for about the CBs. Hang in there, people. We'll be right back. States Naval Construction Battalion's Atlantic Fleet. The famous fighting Seabees, men skilled in building and trained to protect their handiwork. Their famous insignia epitomized the spirit and skills of the most unique of United States forces. Construction Battalion was just too unwieldy for men with a mission, shortened to the initials CB, and then to the now world-famous Seabees. 
The insignia shows an angry and determined bee diving across a field of blue outlined with a hawser. He clutches a wrench and a hammer. On each wrist is the insignia of the Civil Engineer Corps of the Navy. The men who wear this insignia have helped turn the tide of battle in nearly every military involvement of this country since World War II. Our fighting men in Africa, Sicily, and France have landed on pontoon piers and sped to the front lines over roads and bridges built by the men of the Navy Construction Battalion. Oh, thank you, John. That's a real historic film. I love those old films. And talking about those pontoon bridges, we went across a lot of them, and I don't know who built them, but I'm glad they were there. And if the Seabees did them, thank you very much. I know Army engineers and guys like that did it, but we appreciate that. So let's... Uh, Let's start a little bit about Vietnam. You got into Vietnam. You said you had went there with no weapons training. That's correct. I just got sent up to naval support activity. And the third day in country, I had to report into a lieutenant commander. And he asked me, where do I want to go and what do I want to do? So at 19 years old, I was dumbfounded. But I said, I'd like to work in my rate or MOS. And he put me in a diesel generator repair shop at China Beach. Okay. And what about a weapon? So you did you see a weapon in Vietnam, your own weapon? The first month there, we had no weapons at all. No helmets, really? no flak. Nothing. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> Let's get back to the weapon. What was your first weapon that you had there in Vietnam? M14. M14. Okay. That's, yeah, that was pretty basic when you first got there. Um, talk about the uh, activity in uh, Da Nang area by China Beach. Okay. My, my job was to go around and check all these diesel generator um, uh, sites. I would check the oil, the water, the batteries. And then I'd start them up and turn on the lights, un put them under load, and then shut them down so they were ready for the uh, night operation. That's what I did for the first month that I was in Vietnam. Okay. Um, what about the, the Viet Cong POWs? What did they do when they were with, uh, you had them in your custody? Well, that was down in Quang Nai. That's after I left uh, Da Nang. And when I went to Quang Nai to the V Advisory Team 2 compound, that's where I had to stand guard watching them one time. What were they doing? Filling, filling sandbags. Filling sandbags. I remember we filled a lot of sandbags. I don't know. that We could have used some of those guys helping us. Okay. And... Uh, <laughs> Oh, there you go. Tell us about this bunker here. That's that's my bunker. The uh, tower on the top was the the Marines uh, uh, man that uh, they right. were up there. Okay, was that right on the uh, on the edge of the wire, like pretty close? It looks like a lookout tower. Well, if you can see the road there in back of the bunker. And then you see some more wire. Then you went into the South Vietnamese Army area. They okay. were on. They were on three sides of our compound. I got you. And what's up with the basketball hoop over there? I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> A little recreation time? No, uh, I not. I didn't. I didn't do it. Well, I, I I did shoot a couple of hoops, but you know. All right. It was an That's interesting. Cool. Yeah, we played volleyball a little bit in the Coochie when I was there. We had a volleyball net set up. What about the uh, that bunker that you had there? Um, was that a straight-in entrance door and just like a big room? Right. It was a, just a solid uh, cement room. Okay. we. Uh, I ran into some, some different kind of uh, bunker setups. Uh, a lot of the NVA and, and, and Viet Cong set up bunkers underneath or actually underneath they weren't even a bunker, I guess. I guess, uh, I guess it was a bunker. But as you went underneath their hooches, if you threw a hand grenade in and you threw it down, you had to go like in like a little pattern, like a little zigzag pattern. So if you threw a grenade in, 
it would it wouldn't go around the corner. So they could be in like three or four different more lengths right. of, of space, and yet the concussion might do something to them. But there was no frag, no sh uh, no shrapnel uh, injuries on them uh, or, or death because of it. And the fact is, right. one time I threw one in there, and I went to check, and I was just like looking, you know, all around at one time, and all of a sudden this mama san was standing right in front of me. I have no idea where she came from. She was probably about four foot three with the with the mm -hmm. old hat they used to have on, that bamboo hat and, and pajamas. And uh if she was a a Viet Cong or NVA, I was I was dead. I I just froze. It was like she was right there. I had it was like startling, crazy. Okay, let's move on here. Um talk about Camp Tian Sha at the foot of Monkey Mountain. Yeah, that was uh, my first, uh, what do you call it, uh, where, where my, my barracks was. Okay. Uh, that was a case of Monkey Mountain. And every morning I'd jump on a cattle car and go down to the generator shop and uh, get off and then go to work. So these generators, they help to keep uh, headquarters and uh, what, hospitals or aid stations and... Uh... What other things going beside the water purification? Yeah, they did, but I didn't. I didn't service any of them. Mine were smaller ones that use that they use for uh, nighttime lighting. Oh, I got you. Okay, yeah. Okay, cool. There you go. That's, that's, that, I guess that was important. And in Quag Night, five. Uh, you had some CBs uh, went to replace the South. Korean water purification specialty guys, and well, tell they, us about they, that. They, yes, the South Korean civilians ran the generators and purified water, but they one was killed in a mortar attack, and then one was really wounded bad, so they wanted to get out of there, so they replaced those civilians with. The okay, and uh, what then? Then Ted hit right. Tell us about yeah. zero one hundred hours on that night. Well, in that one picture that you show of me with my sunglasses on, and <laughs> that's where I was standing. That's the one. Uh, I came down off of that tower. I had to check the water level behind that white sign. There's a rubber uh, barrel in there. And I came down and I uh, was standing there and I looked at my watch and at 0, 0100, the uh, whole world lit up. They started lobbing mortars in and machine gun fire and you name it. And it was not good. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I know. All over the place it wasn't good. You're right. Yeah. We were up in uh, in Quang Tree Province there out in the field as well. Um, talk about, I was uh, really surprised to hear that the CBs didn't do any demolition work. They did much more construction and sort of civil affairs work than uh, demolition. Tell us about that. Yeah, mostly, and here again, not to take anything away from the Marine Corps engineers or the Army engineers or the Air Force Red Horse engineers, but uh, the CBs, they built schools and uh, clinics and uh, drilled wells and uh, taught the Vietnamese how to run equipment and use uh, the various tools and uh, and they built bridges and airfields and roads. That's about what we were doing, except for me. I, you know, they, we were all over the place. You know, right? Yeah. Did you ever see any uh, landing zones or fire bases built from ground? from nothing to the base itself? Uh, no, I did not. No, so when you got there, everything was already established and nothing new uh, Nothing new went in. Okay, we ever right. called out any, any emergencies? Not, I, I was not. Not after Ted, nothing hit a generator or nothing, uh, no artillery or mortar rounds yeah. or rockets or whatever? They tried to hit the generator's jack and uh, there was a dud oh. between the our fence and the road, but it didn't go off. But uh, Really? That's interesting, a dud, yeah. There were a lot of duds after the war they had. To, uh, they're still doing it now. 
Fifty years later, well, they're still trying was, to clear mines and, and artillery was, and, and Air Force bombs out. There was one dud that uh, didn't go off because if it had, I wouldn't be doing this interview with you. It was 10 <laughs> feet away. Yeah, I understand that. Believe me. Okay, now we're going to do a little photo segment. Uh, we're going to show the photo, and you can explain to us and the audience what it is. Okay. That's our Naval Support Activity Patch. That was not there when I was there. I don't know when this came out. Okay, next. That's another aftermarket patch that, you know, for United States Navy Seabees, you know, didn't wear them when we were on active. This is a barracks that burnt down. We got called out on alert, and a lot of the guys had uh, light bulbs in their lockers to keep the moisture out. And I guess during the call out for the alert, one of them got broke and set the barracks on fire. <laughs> really? Oh, that's terrible. We had hand grenades and ammunition. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, that's a picture looking at the generator shack, like in the middle, and then past that right. South Vietnamese army. Okay. These are some captured uh, Viet Cong, uh, North Vietnamese army weapons that uh, were captured by the army. Those are my two CB buddies, Larry Vermalm and John Hoskin in the background. What's that, a 51 caliber there? Yes, sir. The big one pointed there. That was crazy. Yeah. Interesting yeah. how uh, uh, it's interesting how they could shoot our rounds in their guns, right. I thought. This is what I heard, but we couldn't shoot their rounds because they were a slight, a trace larger. That's theirs, really interesting. They, yeah. Correct. Yeah. We couldn't, theirs was a large, you know, we couldn't fire theirs, but they could fire ours. Yeah. Okay. How about this? Okay, that's an aerial view of part of Quang Nai, and in the very sort of like dead center, you can see our compound. It's it's hard to pick out from there, but this is downtown Quang Nai. Looks like a typical Vietnamese uh, city village. Uh, well, not village. Yeah, they were small. Quang Nai was pretty big, though. Yeah. Yeah. I really don't know what the population was. I'm sorry. There you I mean, go. This, yeah, okay. This is a map now. The, the the red line going north and south, that's Highway 1. Right. And if you come over to the right, you can see the outline of the old French Army Citadel. And we are dead set in the middle of that. Good. And it's the last photo coming up now. Okay, that's me on the left. I use the 282nd Assault Helicopter Company. I flew with them quite off, often to go to, to Da Nang and pick up parts or have paperwork done. They were good guys, great guys. That's great, man. Good for you. All right, John, I thank you very much for this. Hold on one second. I got something for you. I got it. United States CB flag for you. We're going to send this to the mail for you. And we're going to uh, send it to all our other guests. We just got another shipment in. So uh, we have these in our store at portalneverforgotten.com. Pick up service flags, division flags, unit flags, whatever you need to do. And uh, mm -hmm. any questions? Okay, we got one here from Thomas Forchette. Oh, what I went to school. Him. Really? He, Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's crazy. I I went to Hershey High School in Hershey, Pennsylvania, for my senior year, and I he's a colonel. Okay, um, there you go. Well, he said, "What were you armed with?" And we know now you had it uh, M14. And did Charlie ever penetrate your wire? And what about no. ambushes or night attacks by the enemy on your base? Not where we were. No. Oh, pretty fortunate. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Next. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate it. And uh, I'm glad I finally met a CB. 
Never knew what no. they did. I mean, I guess I knew what they did, but they can do anything, right? Can do? Can do. <laughs> okay, brother. Well, thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Till next time, I want to just thank my son, Matthew, for doing such a ter terrific job with the uh, production of all these things that go on here. And uh, thank you very much. God bless you. And see you next week.